being an infectious disease we do? doctor. We know safe. <laughs> we do. We really know safe, really. This is yeah, yeah, Compared great. To, let's put it this way. I said it just because a lot of people will not know what you mean by that. I can call you Dr. Cherry. <laughs> Absolutely. You bet. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Seema, so I I don't disagree with that. There has never been a study in medicine, and I've been in medicine 35 years, I'm sure a long time like you have, doctor. On the other hand, there is definitely data that vaccines have prevented certain diseases, like polio. You know, we don't see any paralysis from polio anymore. Just I vaccines, think I think. Without talking about just uh, general, the general vaccination. Well, I'd like to hear what Dr. Seema would say, and then I have a follow-up comment to that. Yeah. And, God, reason, and God bless the, you for being yeah. in your pers 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 perspective, really. Seriously, yeah. we need people. So like we you. brought on a medical doctor, and they ask, you know, the scholar asked the medical doctor, and he said, This is the day, the day here to have a heart to heart to you know get to uh some very important questions that people have on the topic of, of vaccines in general and i just had a program uh last week and i interviewed one of my guests this was uh, a pharmacist by the name of abu isa and we had a very nice conversation we went back and forth and i tried to uh just be well balanced and present both sides and just to get you know some of the things that people have a hesitancy because now there's some unanswered question and they keep he hearing certain things that vaccines are safe you know they're the best things since peanut butter and whatnot so uh what i left off with was asking him people have a question regarding this consensus he said how can we question this when there's a whole group of academic scienti scientists you know globally you know that agree to this is it is this i'll start is this true dr sima yeah you know we you're talking about the safety right about safety yes yeah, so of your common vaccines that we have i'm not even getting right. to the, the the current one you know, we know that the vaccines are safe. We do? We do? We, <laughs> being an infectious disease we do? doctor. We know safe? <laughs> we do? We really know safe, really? <laughs> Compared to, let's, let's put it this way. Compared to the disease, say, if you have to choose between the disease and taking the You have to choose vaccine. between a fever, a cough, a rash, and some diarrhea. You would uh -huh. take on allergy, asthma, eczema, ADD, ADHD, insulin-dependent diabetes, and seizures. Mm -hmm. You would take that's the trade-off. So but compared, what's the percentage? What is the percentage? To the date. Uh -huh. So yeah. we know safe, right? Because we've never had a placebo-controlled trial. We yeah. know what every ingredient synergistic toxicity is, right? We know what every ingredient is. Uh -huh. We really? Where did you find that study? I'd like to see that one. We know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't. We that. don't know. That's the point. Yeah. We make an yes. assumption that just yes. because we say safe and effective over and over again, uh -huh. and just because there's a large group of people who have bought that, that 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 assumption is true, mm -hmm. that we move that forward in groupthink and make the mm -hmm. assumption that it's true. We make the assumption that the injection of these non-proven to be safe compounds with no synergistic toxicity that we can give multiple vaccines at the same time with no synergistic toxicity is gonna be safer than a fever, a cough, a rash, some diarrhea um, <clears throat> for the vast majority of people who contract an, a, a viral infection. Sorry, we think. know that, right? We know that. Uh, we don't know just, that, doctor. Can you explain for us what is meant by synergistic um, toxicity? Because a lot of people will not know what you mean by that. Well, synergistic toxicity is you take one ingredient alone and test it. And we know from basic high school chemistry that you can have three completely inert compounds sitting on a table, and you can mix all three of those compounds together and cause a reaction that could actually bubble over the top, maybe even explode the test tube. That's yeah. synergistic toxicity. That one by itself may be okay, but when you add a whole bunch of compounds, and there are more than 160 different ingredients in the various vaccines, when you put them all together, you may have an unknown consequence. Even with pharmaceutical medications, you can have active metabolites, right? You can take a pill, it can break down in the liver, you can have active metabolites. And when you take, there has never been a study in medicine, 
and I've been in medicine 35 years, I'm sure a long time like you have, doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this respectfully, that there has never been a synergistic toxicity test of even pharmaceutical pills of more than two at a time. And yet we prescribe people to take four or five, six medicines, and we really don't know the effects of those active compounds and those active metabolites. The same is true with vaccines. No, I totally agree with your statement. We are talking about, you know, relative. If, if a person, uh, I have seen that with, the, are we talking about COVID? Are we talking about different uh, Infection. Just regular, the regular vaccines, just regular, you know, the standard. And, and may I ask, and may I ask you, doctor, where, what kind of a hospital, what hospital system you work in? Are you a, a pediatric there. infection or adult? No, I am adult. Adult. And you yeah. work where? I am in Illinois uh, suburbs, Hoffman States. Okay. Is it a big hospital? Is it like a, a level three center? Yes, it is a big hospital that we have just for discussion. We have discharged. Uh, I think 1,200 patients just from my hospital with COVID. Okay, so what happens at big tertiary hospital centers? Mm -hmm. And I it's don't not a tertiary that. hospital; it's a community hospital. Well, it's a big center. But, yeah. It and is. I and are you are you hospital based or office based? Uh, both. Okay. As you know, infectious diseases is mostly hospital. Most hospital, right? Yeah. So what I don't at all, at all, dis, um, um, discount or um, toss away anybody who may have died from an infection. It mm -hmm. happens. That's why you're an expert, and that's why we have a specialist in, in infectious disease. We have that. Mm -hmm. But by the time someone gets an infection and ends up in the hospital, ends up in intensive care, and requires your services, we have mm -hmm. a very small subset of people who are the sickest of the sickest. I agree. That does not at all co equate to the normal infections that happen in normal kids out in the community. True. Mm -hmm. So you end up, God bless you, that you end up in the very sickest of the sick situations, taking care of people that require a subspecialist, not just a doctor that can prescribe an antibiotic or an antiviral, but requires your expertise. So you have a bit of a skewed perspective as a physician that you get to see the sickest of the sick. But yet we would vaccinate everyone down to the healthiest of the healthy. We inject foreign matter into healthy children all the time that would just normally have a fever, a cough, a rash, and some diarrhea and recover with full lifetime immunity. So, Dr. Shari, just sorry, just to uh, kind of ask you on your kind of um, perspective on this, is what you're saying that uh, is your position that we shouldn't uh, vaccinate the healthiest of the society, or is your position that? vaccine altogether are not are, are not good or that we should be vaccinating those who are at the highest risk what's your exact position of these well after 20 years and more than 40,000 hours i'm not sure doctor how many hours you've spent specifically digging through the medical literature looking at problems with vaccines i've spent 20 years and 40,000 hours on this so i didn't just decide Two weeks ago that this was a topic i wanted to talk about <laughs> so so no, it's been a lot of time. And so, no so my, I, my position is is that vaccines are not safe mm -hmm. they don't keep you from getting sick because you can be fully vaccinated and contact contract the infection anyways they do cause harm and sometimes death and that health is an inside out phenomenon you know, it has to do with uh, the Krebs cycle and all of the different nutrients that you have. And it has, um, you know, it's how you keep healthy from, because we swim in bugs all day long, but we only get excited about, about bacteria and viruses for which we have a vaccine. Now, how many infectious disease cases, doctor, do you see that you take care of that are deathly sick, very sick, that we don't have a vaccine for? I'm sure quite a few as an expert. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we are... I we are talking about two different things here. You know, are we talking about COVID only, or we are we want a discussion about vaccines? Just I vaccines, think I think. Without talking about just uh, general the general vaccination. Just yeah. general general vaccines before even you know this one, uh, what's in its trial stages came out. Just the regular vaccine. And you know, it's how you look at the situation. As Dr. Sherry, you, is your last name? My last name's Tenpenny. Penny. So I can, call you, Dr. Sherry. You can call, I, Sherry. I can call you Dr. Sherry. <laughs> Absolutely. You bet. <laughs> okay. So, you know, uh, there is a, 
as she said, you know, there is literature that you can spend your lifetime reading about complications and side effects of vaccine and still you won't be done with it. So, so, you know, my, my ex, my husband, who God rest his soul, passed away seven years ago, was a Navy pilot. <clears throat> and he, he said that there was an expression in the Navy. If there was any doubt this plane was not going to was going to crash when we if there's any doubt that this there's that there's a problem, there's no doubt that we're not going to fly. So when we've got t- 30,000 VAERS reports per year to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and they think that's 10%. When we have tens of thousands of children who've been published in medical literature showing problems with vaccines, when do we decide that the risk of the vaccine and the complications and illnesses that come from this vaccine far super exceed the very small number of children who may contract that infection and have an adverse event from it. Right, Dr. When do we weigh that? When do we weigh that? Sorry, just wanted to get Dr. Siemens, because we kind of understand your perspective on the vaccines now. We want to get like an overall response uh, from Dr. Seema, where she stands on, on the vaccine discussion. Um, and why she- no, it is. As a physician, you know, we, the literature, you can see literature both ways. You can see literature that you get side effects and long-term effects from vaccine. And they have data about that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there is definitely data that vaccines have prevented certain diseases like polio. You know, we don't see any paralysis from polio anymore, any weakness from polio. And as you can see, smallpox is eradicated. So you can argue either ways. And it's it's your choice whether is you measles, want to take Is measles, it. measles another example? Yes, you, measles usually is the measles. other one. <clears throat> and what right. was the trade-off from that? The trade-off? From, <clears throat> from um, I, oh, oh, first of all, polio is still around. And we, we, but there are more cases every year on an ongoing basis of paralysis caused by the vaccine than paralysis caused by the endemic infection. We've actually eradicated, completely eradicated off the planet, one of the three strains inside of the polio vaccine, but yet we continue to use the same vaccine, vaccinating for something that doesn't exist. In the Western hemisphere, We've had no polio since 1991. We've been declared polio free. There are less than 10 countries in the world that still have any level of endemic polio. And yet here in the United States, even though we are vac- we're vaccinating for something that doesn't exist, we give children four to five doses of polio vaccine for a virus that has not existed in the Western hemisphere since 1991. Sorry, can I just I'll ask a question here at this juncture? I know I know that you guys are having. I don't want to interrupt too much, but just because um, a lot of lay people, especially those who have been um, obviously uh, exposed to mainstream narratives, let's say, will be given the measles example. <coughs> basically, the fact that if you look at the ratio of people that have been uh, that were dying uh, before the measles vaccine was two pretty- and two and two million kids were dying per year. That's 1963 data. Yeah. Two out of two million, there were two deaths per million children that contracted measles the year before they started giving the measles vaccine. That's CDC data. So millions and millions of children dying in America from measles wasn't happening. What's, sorry, what's CDC? Centers for Disease Control. So what's your reaction to that, Dr. Simo? No, Sorry, I doctor. Doctor, my ho- my co-host is from uh, have- from uh, England. From he's from UK, so they have a different one over there. Doctor Sherrod, they don't know about the CDC. Oh, I see. Okay. He's from England. Yeah, from London. Okay. Oh, oh, you're from England. No, I am from a developing country. Mm-hmm. You know, I have seen measles. I have seen polio when uh, you know when I was in training. So <laughs> I I have not you seen. Doctor? So if we can get that disease burden down with vaccination, I think it's an achievement if we do not have those cases. It's not, I think we are not talking about uh, U.S. Yes, U.S., there is low incidence, but still we have seen cases of measles. 
But I agree, not everybody dies with measles, but they have been uh, bad outcomes from measles in children. But we also have written evidence of people that had contracted measles as a child, like I did. I had measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis twice. I had all of those things. I think it's one of the reasons I'm a very healthy adult because my immune system was allowed to have fever and exercise its cytokine reactions at the appropriate age. Now we have evidence that shows that people who had had measles at a young age had a much lower incidence of brain cancer. They have a much lower incidence of autoimmune diseases. You know, measles was always a, um, a natural symbiont, which means that we work together for the, for, not for you, doctor, but for the audience, that a symbi symbiotic relationship is that that was a good thing that when we had a measles infection, that it burned off the residual adult pro mother proteins and it locked in our basement membranes. And in fact, in the 1940s, children that had nephrotic syndrome, which is a condition, again, for the audience, a condition that the basement membranes of their kidneys were leaky and they used to leak proteins. And sometimes if it was a severe case, children could die from that. The treatment for that was to induce measles. They exposed them, and when they had the high fever and had the measles infection, it sealed those basement membranes and cured their nephrotic syndrome. We uh, have a symbiotic relationship with a lot of microbes. We're not Sherry, just I'm, here I'm, to get rid of them. Dr. Sherry, I'm just looking at some data now. There's a the Oxford University has like a, a website called Vaccination Knowledge, and I'm just going to read out to you something that they were right. I want you to react to it. They say the graph below, there's a graph below, right? But it shows that the reported number of measles cases in the UK between 1940 and 1995. It says before a vaccine existed, there were often hundreds of thousands of measles cases every year. Cases. Cases. Yeah. yeah, I'm with you. It says here, in 1967, the year before a vaccine was first introduced, there were 460,407 suspected cases of disease. By the end of 1980s, uh, vaccinations had brought these figures down to around 10,000 suspected a year. Cases. With, with one or two deaths, it says there. One or two. Yeah, and since then, measles have, uh, measles cases have fallen still further. So, cases. Yeah, and it's, uh, it did mention deaths as well here. So how would you one react? Or two, one or two out of there. So our data, and it goes all the way back to 1963. So cases. Yeah. You have no idea what recovery rate is when they report large numbers of cases. Cases does not equal death. Cases means they had an infection and all but one or two of those recovered. So yeah. that I, you know. Can I ask you guys, uh, yeah. tell me this, this, uh, this is the billion dollar question. And recently we also had in our community, we had some uh, people come together and they brought on a medical doctor and they ask, you know, the scholar asked the medical doctor and he says, does autism, does, do vaccines cause autism? And then the standard answer is no, it doesn't. So, and then you go on the CDC website and it says the same thing. So how would you guys answer this? Well, I would say for one thing, the CDC was just forced to take vaccines do not cause autism off of their website. It's no longer there because they had to admit that it does and it can. We've got adjudicated course cases plus on the package inserts, it actually describes that vaccines, one of the side effects is encephalopathy, which means your brain isn't working correctly. And by definition, if your brain's not working, if your brain's working incorrectly, depending on how severe that encephalopathy is, it can be diagnosed as autism. We've just learned as a community and as a bunch of physicians the knee-jerk reflex about, uh, about vaccines and autism without looking at the adjudicated cases through the vaccine court, without looking at the medical literature, without looking at the, at the sealed indictments or a sealed documents, without looking around at the community and talking to parents that have video recordings of their kid's birthday being normal getting their vaccines and a week later they've descended into autism which they do allow that as evidence in court cases what are the cases doctor i mean how how prevalent is this if we're talking about for example 100 uh, percent of children that have been vaccinated how many of them exhibit these uh, symptoms of autism well, new, Jer is it less new, Jer than new, new jersey data is one in 24 kids oh. one in 24 
are on the spectrum. Like and know? and we have we've heard data that have come from Dr. Stephanie Sunoff, who's a PhD out of MIT, that if we continue on the same vaccination schedule with impunity, okay. by 2030 or 2035, the uh, the rate of autism in this country alone, we're not talking in the world, this country will be one in two. And of that 1%, of, of that 50%, more than half of those will be boys. Now, if there's any doubt, there's no doubt. And I believe that one of the biggest problems with the vaccine schedule is how many that we give at a time. Because again, it goes back to the, it goes back to the synergistic toxicity thing. If we, and now children, because children now get multiple doses of 17 different vaccines. Uh, doctor, you said that it's, it's one out of 24 in New Jersey. That's about one and a half percent almost of cases, right? So, question is, uh, what, what exactly are you are you making reference to? So, those who are watching can can check the references. You can find that anywhere. I mean, there's it, there's a lot of data in in the U.S. I don't have a reference off the top of my head. I haven't looked at, I haven't spent a lot of time on the autism da data lately. I've been my head's kind of been in COVID. So, you know, I didn't know that was going to be like a, a question, you know, I, but there's one in 24 in New Jersey. There's places are, that are greater than that. I mean, there's that data you can find. It's out there. What about the uh, comment, comment, comment? Go ahead, Mohammed. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Siba. How do you respond to that? I think this is one of the biggest worries that people taking vaccines will have. That, in fact, we're talking about 5%. Uh, um, you know, very, but, if we take that on face value, five percent most. Well, I'd like to hear what Dr. Seema would say, and then I have a follow-up comment to that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have heard. I don't want to give any numbers to it, but I have heard parents that, as uh, Sherry mentioned, that they believe that the child was normal prior to vaccination. Do I have any data to back up? No, but I have heard personally. I'm not talking as a infectious disease physician, but as a, uh, as a community member. I have heard that. Yeah. But have I looked up in it, or do I have any comment about it? No. What are you talking about in particular that caused the uh, autism? It can be any of them. I mean, we, we put a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus on MMR over the years, but it can be you know, it can be DPT, it can be any of them. It can be hepatitis B, it can be DPT, it can be any of them. I've got a problem question here. Some will argue that this uh, tenuous link or this problem between correlation and causation, a lot of these kids would have been diagnosed with autism anyway because growing up, autism is not usually detected in up until, let's say, for example, a certain age. And so those kids, we have no way of proving that they wouldn't have had uh, autism had they not been vaccinated. How except except look at the unvaccinated population. What is the incidence of, of autism in the completely unvaccinated population? It's almost as close to zero as you can get. And why has it that the powers that be, whether it's in the UK or the CDC or the World Health Organization or, or UNICEF or any of those organizations who spend billions, and I'm talking tens of billions, maybe even hundreds of billions of dollars a year to vaccinate everyone in the world. Why have they not set aside a couple million dollars of that to do a really well done, really well done, well designed study to compare the health of un completely unvaccinated kids to kids who are fully vaccinated? Why haven't they done that? They've refused to do it. It's been requested multiple times. We have small studies that have been self-funded to try to show the health of that. Why do they refuse to do it? Because you can't find what you're not looking for. And you don't want to show under any circumstances that unvaccinated children have an intact, healthy immune system and are not in the same category of asthma, allergies, eczema, ear infections, um, on and on and on, seizure disorders, epilepsy as vaccinated kids. They don't want that data out there. Therefore, they don't fund studies to do it. Not even come close, Mohammed. Not even close. Let me ask you guys before I know you got a hard stop uh, coming up in 10 minutes. You and Dr. Seema, both this question for both of you guys. I asked, I, I wanted just to talk about vaccines in, in general. We kind of went over here on this side. 
Uh, back to the, the billion dollar question, usually what's brought up, and it was also in this question that was asked to a scholar, to the, to the doctor, and the doctor repeated that, uh, no, there's no link. And then he brought up what's always brought up is Dr. Wakefield, that he was discredited. He's the one that brought this up. You know about this, uh, obviously, Dr. Seema? The Dr. Wakefield, and he was discredited, and then that case is closed now. What do you guys have to say? My opinion about that is if your only defense and your only argument is a 1998 paper that was pulled, can't you, don't you think there may have been a little bit more research since then? I think that it's such a lame argument, it's almost laughable. If you ever re actually read the original paper, he didn't, but it's, it, that's the other reason why that is such a lame argument with people who really don't know the science and are just trying to uh, use sound bites to change the dialogue because they really have no idea what they're talking about. Dr. Seema, did you want to comment? I, I, yeah, autism, you know, we, I go by CDC data, you know, being an infectious disease physician. So I, it, as I said, autism, parents feel strongly about it, that autism is associated with vaccines. But I see a benefit from vaccines. You know, being at this situation, position, at my position, I still feel that vaccines are helpful, but can they have side effects? Yes, they can. They do have side effects. So I think it's the choice of the person who's taking the vaccine. They have to consider and the risk and the benefits. The parents and their parents and the patients, you know, whoever is taking Dr. Seema, they have thank, to risk it. Dr. Seema, thank you so much for saying that. Because yeah. that's exactly where it should be. We should yeah. not be mandating any exactly. vaccine because yeah. the one it's the one area of medicine. Yeah. And you would concur with this, Dr. Seema, I know you will, that it's the, when it comes to vaccination, it's the one area of medicine that we don't take into consideration family history, individual genetics. We don't take into it, you know, our food history. What are people eating? What is their lifestyles? Who is at greater risk? And, and you know, when you've got two parents that say, hey, when I was a kid, I had severe reactions to vaccines. They're like, doesn't matter, just vaccinate your kid anyways. It's, you know, when we take a, a medical history, as you know, we ask for things like cancer history, autoimmune diseases, seizures. Do you have a history, if you have a patient that has headaches, do you have a family history of migraines? We always want to know what the family history is. Does that make you more susceptible? When it comes to vaccination, vaccinating children, it's the one area of medicine, and even adults, it's the one area of medicine that we completely ignore uh, past medical history and family history. So thank you for saying that. It should be a person's own research and a person's own decision. Uh, Dr. Sherry, our, uh, based on, uh, you know, when we were talking about the deaths, the difference between deaths and cases, the measles, I was able to just pull out something, uh, and this might be flawed, I mean, I'll have to look into the discussions on this, but from the WHO, they say that measles vaccination resulted in a 73% drop in measles deaths between 2000 and 2001. How can they decrease the number of deaths when the death rate is two per million? I guess they could go to 0.5. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, so how would you, respond yeah. to you know, I, I think that would be the, my take on the vaccines is, yes, it decreases the disease. Yes, it decreases the death. But people have experienced some side effects, and it should be an informed decision from, you know, whoever is taking the vaccine, either the parents or themselves. It's agenda to vaccinate. Uh, consensus, uh, Sherry, my guest this week, he kept pushing the thing about us being too um, uh, skeptical, and he kept saying, how can this be, I'm talking about general vaccines, where you have a global community, international community, a consensus. How would you respond to that? I told him that I'd get back to you and hear your response to that. Because I would say that the consensus, the global community, the vast majority of physicians, with all due respect to Dr. Seema, the vast majority of physicians have just said safe and effective vaccinate, and that's all they've done to look into any of it. They've memorized the schedule. They right. may have read. That's it. 
What about the regulatory agencies? What, what about what about the regulatory agencies that are there, Dr. Sherry Penny? They're the global community also. What about them? Scientists, you know, people who are at that level. I have I have over seven I have over seventeen thousand papers in my collection. Seventeen thousand papers of scientists and community people that have shown problems and injuries associated with vaccines. That's not a one-off you know, anecdotal, when you have 17,000 papers that show problems with each of these individual vaccines. I would just say that the global community marched lockstep because that's what doctors do. They march lockstep. They're like a herd, or a pack of herd of water buffalo. They move together and they haven't taken really a deep dive into any of it. If you can send that, yeah. uh, I know you got to go. I want to, we made history here. Why is it that we we have finally been able to put, I mean, two together. And this is Dr. Sima. What do you think? We've been trying to get. I mean, you're a brave soul. Thank you. You are. God. Thank you so much, Dr. Sima. We and need to. We, we, we these are the conversation. What do you think, Mohammed Hijab? These conversations are they important? Honestly, I've, I feel much more elucidated. Uh, I feel much more informed now. But I feel like it's, it should be a taster for me to go and do more research, following the numbers of the trails, the data trails that. The two uh, doctors have, have given us and it's given me a little bit more clarity and I think a lot of people watching this will feel the same way. I want to, you know, because I, I really do have to run, but I want to once again, Dr. Seema, thank you so much because nobody hey, ever wants to do this. I mean, I've we've tried multiple times to get discussions like this and the people who are pro-vaccine advocates will say, I don't want to have a discussion because if if there's a debate, it proves there's something worthy of debate. And you bringing to the table a healthy discussion, you know, of both sides. I really respect that. And thank you so much. I hope we can do this again. I wasn't aware this was going to be the discussion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We made history here. Have you ever sat with three Muslims like this? There's a lot of misconceptions about Muslims. Have you ever sat with three Muslims like this? Absolutely, the first time, and thank you, all three of you. God bless you. <laughs> if you ever have any questions about Islam, anything you got, look up Muhammad Hijabs. He's one of the main guys out there educating people. Uh, you got me. You got Dr. Sima. You made the connection with Dr. Sherry. Any it's data awesome. you want to exchange? We're here for you, Dr. Sherry and Dr. Sima. And vice versa, Dr. Sima. This is because this is where I spend my time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are like, well, here's this set of data. What else is there? I mean, I'm happy. You can read the studies yourself. I mean, the stuff that I pull out comes from mainstream published literature. It doesn't come from conspiratology.com, and it doesn't come from just my opinion. And so if you're interested, I can get them to, to, to Dean, and he can get that on to you. And, um, and then there, you can then have the opportunity to really do fully informed consent with your patients. And, and a patient say, listen, I, I, I don't care what you tell me about the vaccine. I still want to get it. Well, at least you know. And when other people ask you things like, well, what's in it? Are there any long-term studies? What are the complications? Then you can actually have a full, a, a really informed answer for them. And thank you again. I hope we can do this again sometime. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank yeah, you so nice much. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you. And if you like this episode of The Dean Show, like this video, share this video far and wide and support us on our Patreon page so we can continue this work. Thank you for tuning in. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. Subscribe right now.